Good afternoon. First of all, anybody who's standing in the back, there are comfortable seats waiting for you uh, in the first few rows, so please uh, take them. Uh, it is a great pleasure uh, you know, to be here today. Uh, Tim, I guess you're sort of hiding behind me. Thank you so much for hosting this. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be in Tacoma, which are a city I have not seen for 20 years, and it is a different city today. Uh, the health of a community's culture is demonstrated by the number of organizations, the depth of organizations, but one of the real signs is that you have the best of something in the world, or one of the leading institutions of its sort, and that's where we are today, a unique and irreplaceable museum that you know has has uh, grown here and is doing something unlike uh, any other institution in the world. So you know, uh, congratulations to the uh, the uh, the board and the patrons of it. Uh, I wanted to talk today uh, about something I think that we all have in common. I mean, I would imagine the people that have come here today, like me, like my colleagues from the NEA, are people for whom art has played a decisive role in your life. Now, I find myself in a kind of ironic, perhaps even absurd position. Uh, I am a federal bureaucrat in charge of art. <laughs> uh, I run the official arts agency of the United States of America, which was a country which took nearly two centuries to decide it wanted a federal arts bureau and then spent most of the next 40 years trying to shut it down. <laughs> uh, you know, this, this interesting, you know, uh, backstory shouldn't be lost on us. And it's not, for all, you know, we know all the bad things about the culture wars, but there's also something that's at the root of them that I think uh, is wonderfully uh, America, which is the sense of if the United States of America wants to help the arts, how do we do it without hurting the arts? How do we do it without imposing political control uh, you know, on, on arts, which need freedom? And I think that over the 43 years of the National Endowment for the Arts, you know, we have, through a you know, trial and error, discovered a way of playing a positive, catalytic role in bringing the power of the arts to all Americans without inhibiting artistic freedom. Now, the institution that we have is typically American. It isn't like a European ministry of culture. And I think that's one of the reasons why uh, the American arts are so vital, is because they have a local quality. Uh, they come out of, of different institutions, different artists that have different ways of doing the, uh, looking at the world. And the NEA gives you just enough money to get into trouble. Uh, <laughs> and, it, and it's catalytic. Uh, it, it, it basically gives a local institution, a local group, enough money to be able to raise the rest of the money and make the project happen. Now, uh, I don't think we want to be in a situation where we subsidize the arts, though I think that we could you know, safely quadruple the budget before this even becomes, uh, uh, becomes an issue. But we want, in a sense, to do something which the very health of civic life depends on, which is, in a sense, to create partnerships, to make people uh, within a community take ownership of the institutions which shape them and make them uh, better. Now, when, when we're running the endowment, we really have three principles. First and foremost is to support excellence. That what we want is to bring the best of the arts and arts education into every community. Our second principle is sort of the other side of this, which is that we serve all Americans. I mean, I think one of the challenges for the NEA is it was easier to, to essentially fund institutions that were in established art centers, but not everybody lived there. And one of the things that we're proudest of is that over the last six years, we are now present in every American community. And we have done this without lowering our standards, but by essentially getting to know the country better, traveling across the country, finding these significant institutions that are, that are really everywhere in this country now and supporting them. And the reason that we, we want excellence, 
that we believe in democracy, I think is the third principle we have. And this is an odd one. It's an odd one for a federal bureaucrat to talk about. It's a spiritual principle. We believe in the transformative power of art. I don't think there's anybody in this room whose life, in some sense, has not been touched by this. Uh, often very early, that what art does is something quite miraculous. It awakens us to the fullness of our humanity. And you see this, uh, I think, most clearly in children, although I think it never stops, that suddenly, uh, by reading a book, by hearing music, by playing an instrument, by looking at a painting, by learning to dance or to sing or to act, someone discovers things that they're capable of doing that they didn't even suspect. And this knowledge, this knowledge that your own potential is greater than anything that you uh, would have imagined earlier, essentially increases your vistas in life. I mean, uh, growing up, uh, the out of the immigrant families. My father's Sicilian, my mother's Mexican, in a poor neighborhood in Los Angeles. Uh, I was raised by people who their highest aspiration was merely to survive. But it was through music, through reading, that suddenly I discovered all of these possible futures that I might have, that uh, God bless them both my parents, my grandparents, never had the luxury of imagining. The reason that I have, as a writer, walked away from my own art, and I've dedicated the last six years of my life to this job, was a belief that in a free society, we need to make that gift of awakening available to everyone in this country, to every child in this country. And I regret to say that we are not there. The arts education programs have been cut out of most schools, and you see the results of this everywhere. Because we live in a country now where one out of every three teenagers drops out of school. When they drop out of school, their lives are impoverished because of that. Not just the economic uh, disadvantage that they have, but they will live six to seven years less. We know a very basic fact. If you have art programs in a school, attendance goes up. And as Woody Allen once said, rather memorably, 90% of success is showing up. <laughs> uh, the older I get, the more I realize that 90% of success is showing up. So what we want to do is to bring this power, because it, as you awaken the potential of your humanity, what art does is expands it, refines it, educates it, and by understanding yourself better, you gradually begin to understand the world better. Reading a novel which shows you the dailiness of another character's life and their social, physical, economic uh, existence makes you understand that everyone in the world, because since you, in a sense, have awakened your own inner life, you begin to understand that they have inner lives too, as complex as your own. This humanizes you individually, and if you can bring it through society, it expands and refines and develops the humanity of us all. Art not only transforms the lives of individuals, but it transforms the lives of cities, of nations.